What I want to start with is just some kind of brief introductory remarks on Kant. <clears throat> and I've already said, you know, this is going to be the most difficult reading of the course, I think. But um, just a quick reminder that Kant's trying to answer the same kind of question that Mill was. And as you'll see on this bullet, there's two questions, but really they're the same question, just phrased in two different ways. So we can ask, what's the foundation of morality? But what that really means is, what's the ultimate standard or rule or law of right and wrong? Is there some principle we can rely on that's going to give us the right answer about what to do anytime we find ourselves in a situation that has some moral dimension to it? So Mill's answer to that question <clears throat> involved you know, advancing a certain principle that he liked, uh, that he thought gave the correct answer, or would give the correct answer in every conceivable situation, and that was the principle of utility. Kant, on the other hand, is going to answer the same question just in a different way by advancing what he calls categorical imperative and this is <clears throat> just a, a principle um, that's supposed to uh, fill the same gap that Mills did but his principle is you know entirely at odds with the principle that Mill advanced. So what this categorical imperative as it's called is going to do if it succeeds, is to tell us how to act um, if we want to do the morally right thing. It just gives a different answer than Mill's principle, um, but both of these principles are trying to tell us what morality requires of us. And <clears throat> one thing that we're going to want to get really clear on, of course, is what the categorical imperative says. That turns out to be a fairly difficult matter, and so we're going to be spending a good part of this week just attempting to answer that question. Um, what we're going to do today is just lay some kind of necessary groundwork. And this stuff's going to be just as important as what we're doing on Thursday, but it is sort of just uh, leading up <clears throat> to the grand finale uh, on Thursday. But, um, you know, of course you're going to be quizzed on this as much as you will on Thursday's material, and uh, your, you know, exam, your first exam is going <clears> to <throat> cover this material as much as it is the real meat and potatoes, which we won't really get to until Thursday. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, now the preface. So the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals um, is the name of the uh, of the book that Kant wrote, which you're reading only an excerpt of. And so the preface of that book wasn't part of the assigned reading, but I'm going, to be, I'm going to talk a little bit about it at the beginning of this lecture because I think it's going to help to situate what's going on here. So what he does in the preface, which you didn't read, <clears throat> is he first divides philosophy into three basic parts, logic, physics, and ethics. And Kant was writing in the 1700s, and physics was just sort of beginning to emerge as its own thing. Um, but philosophers, I mean, I think correctly for uh, most of... Uh, history, <laughs> um, thought of physics as a part of philosophy, and it was before science really took off, right? So uh, he treats physics here as a part of philosophy along with logic and ethics, and the way he kind of defines these three branches of philosophy <clears throat> is as follows. So he says, look, what does logic do? Well, it governs all of thought, basically tells us what the correct principles of reasoning are, um, how, how to reason, basically. Physics addresses the way that the world is. Um, that shouldn't be surprising if you know much about science. Um, ethics, on the other hand, addresses the way the world ought to be. So this is that you know descriptive physics versus normative uh, ethics uh, distinction that we had already talked about. And so we can rephrase this aim of ethics um, as uh, being concerned with what we ought to do. That's really what it means to say that ethics is concerned with the way the world ought to be. But the reason I want to point this out here, this division he makes between what he calls the three different branches of philosophy, is that um, he points out, or he claims, that all three of these areas are concerned with laws. So we've got logical laws, and those are things like, um, I mean, Aristotle was the first to propose a, set, a system of logical laws and there are things like this. Um, in fact, both of these are Aristotelian logical laws. Uh, that is, logical laws uh, proposed by Aristotle. Uh, one is A is identical to A. Um, that seems just so obvious. It's, uh, it seems ridiculous to even point it out, but it 
becomes important, um, uh, at least in philosophical thinking. Uh, the second is that, you know, either A or not A is the case, so either it's raining or it's not raining. Um, there's no kind of third option. And so these are some examples of what logical laws look like. Um, and there's also physical laws. Uh, Newton's laws of motion are examples. But then, and here's the controversial part, he claims, look, ethics is no different. It's got its own laws. And what Kant aims to do is to tell us what these, law, what these ethical or moral laws are. So that, I think, is like right off the bat a really interesting concept because we don't tend to think of, I don't know, ethics as being concerned with law-like propositions. We think that that's what physics is concerned with. Um, Newton's laws are kind of a prime example. These are supposed to be exceptionless generalizations that hold in all circumstances. That's what a law is. By the way, forget entirely about legal laws here, okay? So we're not, you're going to see in the reading, Kant talks a lot about laws, moral laws. He doesn't have any, he's not concerned at all about laws in the most familiar sense. That is to say, uh, the laws of the state of Arizona or the laws, um, you know, of the United States of America. Um, those kinds of laws have nothing to do with anything that we're concerned about. But again, I just think that uh, it's got to be admitted that our normal conception, our sort of pre-theoretic conception of what, mar of what ethics is all about, doesn't really involve any reference to laws. We think that it's much more, you know, uh, up in the air than that. It's kind of an inexact science or something. But on Kant's view, Ethics is law-like in the same way that logic and physics are. Okay, so what Kant's trying to do in this book, of which you're only reading one small excerpt, is to establish, in the first instance, he wants to establish that there's a domain of laws that apply to our conduct, as I just said, moral laws. And he, he has this, he thinks that if there's, such, if there's to be such a thing as morality at all, so if morality is to even exist, if it's a real thing, <laughs> then there's going to have to be moral laws. So if we don't have moral laws, according to Kant, we don't have morality. So if he can just show that there's such a thing as morality, <laughs> he thinks that he will have established that there are moral laws. Because he thinks that in order for there to be morality, uh, there'd have to be moral laws. And kind of what the, the end game is here, what he's sort of shooting for off in the distance as far as we're concerned, since, we're, since we won't be talking about this until Thursday, at least not in any detail, but what he's really kind of aiming for in the final analysis is to explicate the supreme moral law. Because he thinks there's really just one. And this is called uh, the categorical imperative. So this is... Uh, Sometimes he refers to it as the supreme principle of morality or the, the supreme moral law. But the categorical imperative is what that is, according to him. And we haven't talked about what the categorical imperative says yet, but we will. But in effect, what it requires is that our actions conform to universal principles, principles that hold in all circumstances. So what Kant's trying to do in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals is to establish that there's such a thing as the categorical imperative. Again, the definition of this is forthcoming. And if he's established that there is such a thing as the categorical imperative, he will have established that we have moral obligations. So that's kind of the overarching aim of the book, and hence the overarching aim of the short excerpt of it that you're reading. Now, um, Technically, we're still stuck on the preface here, and so what I want to do uh, before we move on to the stuff that you have read, or, or that you will be reading for this class, is to just draw your attention to a couple of passages from that preface that I think are of particular importance. So, the first of these kind of harkens back to the stuff we were talking about earlier in the semester, or actually not too long ago, just a couple of weeks, um, this uh, clash between rationalism and sentimentalism. We talked about Hume, a sentimentalist, um, we talked a little bit about what rationalism entails, but we haven't read a rationalist until now. <clears throat> now, 
we're not reading Kant in the context of the rationalism sentimentalism debate, but Kant is a rationalist, and this passage I'm about to put up on the screen is a pretty good statement of what his version of rationalism comes to. And so he says, everyone must grant that a law, like a moral law, if it is to hold, that is, if it's to hold as a ground or a reason for a moral obligation that we have, then such a law must carry with it absolute necessity, that is to say it must be universal or hold in all circumstances. So for example, he says, the command, just to take one instance, thou shall not lie, okay, he says, you know, that doesn't hold only for human beings. It would hold if there were other <clears throat> rational beings, like maybe uh, extraterrestrials or something, it would hold for them too. So uh, to return to this bullet, he says, um, that command, thou shall not lie, does not hold only for rational beings, as if other rational beings did, um, did not have to heed it or pay attention to it. And so, um, and so, with all other moral laws properly so called, that is to say, all, all moral laws, if they really are moral laws, will hold universally for any rational being, not necessarily you know, just humans, although that's primarily what we're concerned about, right? So he says uh, that therefore the ground of obligation here must not be sought or looked for in the nature of the human being because the human being is just one incarnation of rational nature. As I said, if such thing as extraterrestrials exist, they would also be um, an instantiation of rational nature and hence an instantiation of uh, uh, the, the source of morality. Right, so the ground of um, obligation uh, must not be sought in the nature of the human being or in the circumstances of the world in which he's placed, but rather simply in concepts of pure reason, that is to say, in rationality itself. So, okay, this is a confusing passage, but this is what reading Kant is like, okay? So I'm going to try to distill this into just one or two sentences. So the basic idea is, like, look, if there's to be such a thing as morality, it's got to, um, Kant contends, it's got to apply unconditionally, universally, as he says here, with absolute necessity. So to take just one example, thou shalt not lie. Um, he's saying, look, we, it, it's not like that's just a human thing. There are moral laws. And anything that is sufficiently rational, these laws will apply to. Because, again, as a rationalist, Kant thinks that rationality and morality are sort of tied at the hip. So we want to look for the ground of obligation, as he says here, in other words, the, uh, the source of morality in rationality itself, not in some contingent facts about human beings. Okay, and the second passage I wanted to <clears throat> draw your attention to from the preface, which again you haven't read, is this. He says, in the case of what is morally good, it is not enough that it conform with the moral law, but it must also be done for the sake of the law. Without this, that conformity to the moral law is only very contingent and precarious, since a ground that is not moral will indeed now and then produce actions in conformity with the law, but will also often produce actions contrary to the law. Now, this I think is even more confusing than the previous passage, but this is something we're going to be actually devoting a fair amount of time to later on in this lecture, I believe, maybe also on Thursday. Um, so... By the time I get done talking about this within the next 30 seconds, um, if it doesn't make sense, that's not a huge deal because it will later on. But I will say a little bit about what the hell this means. So <clears throat> what Kant's saying here is, look, if you perform some action, if we're going to classify that as morally good, it's not enough that uh, it simply be the right thing to do. It actually, in order for it to really be considered morally good, that action needs to be performed for the reason that it's the morally right thing to do. So, for the sake of the moral law. So, why would he think that? Well, he says, if that weren't the case, if it were enough to just say that an action's morally good so long as it happens to be the right thing to do, then that's a very contingent or precarious situation because sometimes actions will by accident turn out to be the right thing to do. 
But no, to be moral is to do the right thing for the, the right reason. That is to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And as we'll see shortly, that's going to actually prove to be a lot more controversial and, uh, and uh, also a, a point of considerable significance um, for Kant's view than it might at first seem. So what I want to do next is talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, duty and what he refers to as the goodwill. So this is where your reading comes in because the past, the excerpt that you're reading for this class picks up at this point. So at the very outset, what Kant claims to be doing is this. What he wants to do is to start from our ordinary way of thinking about morality and analyze our, our ordinary way of thinking about morality to see if that can shed any light on the nature of it. And so he thinks that doing so is going to help us to discover the principles that underlie our ordinary common sense everyday moral thinking. Now one thing that's interesting to note is that this is really the same kind of basic strategy that Mill followed. It's just that Mill thought that when we analyze our ordinary common sense everyday way of thinking about morality that we're led to the principle of utility. Kant, on the other hand, thinks that when we do this, we're going to be led to the categorical imperative. So they start with the same basic approach, but they end up in two very different points. So at this very first point in the reading, he's not yet trying to prove that we do have moral obligations. That's something he'll set aside and you know, take up again later. What he's trying to do in the beginning is just to figure out what we would have to show in order to prove that we have moral obligations. And so he's just looking at the way we think about morality in a common sense everyday way and see if that's going to help us <coughs> answer this question. And th the first thing he does is he focuses on this idea of a good will. So he begins by claiming that nothing at all is good without qualification except a good will. Well, what do I mean when we say nothing is good without qualification? Well, just good in an unqualified way. Um, if that terminology is confusing to you. What that means, in essence, is good in all cases and circumstances, no matter what. So he's saying nothing is good in all cases and circumstances, come hell or high water, except a good will. A good will is the only thing that is good in all circumstances. So, right off the bat, an introduction of a piece of jargon that we need to get clear on, and that's this terminology, uh, will. So what is a will? Well, I just want to make sure this is crystal clear. It does not mean, when we say a good will, something like um, charity or a friendly attitude or good will, one word. So a good will, two words, is very different from good will, one word. Okay, so... I think some students have this temptation to read it that way uh, when you first see it, and that's definitely a mistake. So that's not what it means. Well, what does it mean? Um, that's somewhat difficult to pin down. Um, the, probably the, the best first approximation we could get is to just, every time we see the word goodwill, um, to uh, transpose it as good character, but that's not really good enough. So we'll say a little bit more about that. And the way I want to do this is to just look at something that Kant says uh, about the effects of a good will. So a person who does the right things for the right reasons demonstrates or reveals a good will. Um, so you can think of your will as the rational decision-making part of you that decides how to act based on the reasons that you're presented with. I'm going to read that again because it's of critical importance. This is probably the best approximation we're going to get of what a will is. Again, it is the rational decision-making part of you that decides how to act based on the reasons that you're presented with. So a good will is going to be um, this whole thing that is morally good. <laughs> so if we want to really dumb this down, we could say that a good will is just analogous to the idea of a good person. Somebody who's got good motivations or intentions um, or a, a good rationale. I'm sorry, not rationale, a good um, 
character. Right? Okay, so in this first passage of the text that you've got to read for this week, what Kant does is it begins by claiming that nothing whatsoever is good without qualification, right? We've already seen that, um, except, of course, a good will. So let's take a look at some things that are just good. Forget good without qualification or good without exception. Let's just look at some instances of things that are good. And, you know, we can basically adduce a list here of some common virtues. So courage, generosity and charity, temperance, strength, okay, all of this stuff, right? Those things are all good, but Kant's going to say they're not good without qualification. And this is really interesting. I think he actually does a good job of establishing this in terms of why that would be so. I and mean, you look at this list, he says, okay, yeah, these things are good, but they're not like good period, good full stop. Um, they're good in some cases, not good in all cases. And he's going to, so here's why he thinks that. Um, so they're only good and desirable for certain purposes. And so if you think about, you know, the wrong person having these qualities, like a person with a bad will um, or bad character having those qualities of courage, strength, intelligence, and so forth, those things can actually become extremely bad. So I'm going to pause to just kind of reiterate what's going on here. Kant thinks that the only thing that is good without qualification is a good will. So the way he wants to establish that is to take other things that you might have thought could be good without qualification and to show that really they're not good without qualification, they're just good in some instances. The way he's going to try to prove that is to say, well look, let's take some of those things. Courage, intelligence, generosity. And, I'm going to sh and Kant says, I'm going to show you that if we take a bad person, <laughs> a person with a bad will, that's enough to make these good traits become very bad things. If you take a person with an evil or bad will, then intelligence can become a bad thing. So evidently intelligence, to, just use, to use just one example, isn't something that's good without qualification. So we'll, you know, um, sort of uh, elaborate on this now. So. Think about it this way, a person with a bad will or character can use those things on this list right here, generosity, temperance, etc. They can use those things to do bad things that they couldn't have done without those character traits. So, you know, we don't think that wealth is an unqualified good. It can be used uh, to cause a lot of harm. It can also be used to cause some good, but what that shows is that it's not good without qualification. It's good in some cases, bad in others. And Probably the best example is to think of intelligence. Intelligence, Kant claims, is not something that's good without qualification either. Why? Because take a, a person with a bad will, a criminal mastermind, right? This person uses this thing, intelligence, for a bad purpose. So intelligence isn't good without qualification. It depends on the will of the person it's uh, found in. And Christine Korsgaard, this Kant commentator, um, really one of the, the top Kant scholars uh, in contemporary philosophy, gives some additional examples in her discussion um, of Kant's moral philosophy. So he says, like, or she says, you know, take, for instance, a scientist. So he may be uh, brilliant at his work, and yet he may use his gift of intelligence for evil ends. Or take a political leader who may achieve, um, achieve fine ends, but be ruthless in the cost um, she's willing to impose on others in order to carry out her plans. So the point is just that any character trait that you think might be good, right? You know, so, so I mean, we might say, oh, you know, what really matters morally is that we're like, you know, generous, or that we're, um, I don't know, um, we exercise temperance or courage. And Kant's saying none of this stuff is none of these things are good candidates for what really matters morally because in some situations they can be good things in some situations they can be bad things so what we need to ask is what determines whether a person's good or bad if it's not those things 
it's got to just be their will or their intention, their desire to do the right thing um, simply because it's the right thing to do. And we just talk, talked about a couple of examples of things that aren't good without qualification, but Kant's going to want to try to generalize this um, totally and say, you know, every single thing you can think of um, that might seem to be a good contender for something that's good or desirable may be good or, may be good or desirable, but not without qualification, not in every single circumstance, um, except a good will. And, um, you know, that doesn't commit him to having to say that, you know, courage and generosity and such aren't really good after all. No, he's just, just saying that they're not good in an absolute way. They're not, you know, they're not good unconditionally. Okay, now, if we contrast this with a good will or good character, we're going to find that the same thing can't be said for that. So, a good will is good in all circumstances, is good without qualification or limitation. So, um, we can explain why he thinks that as follows. So, you know, if I decide to do something X, and I make that decision just on the basis of having a good will, right, then that means that by definition I've decided to do that thing X because that's what morality requires of me, okay? Because to have a good will is to do the right thing for the right reason, that reason being that it's just the right thing to do. So if I decide to do something and I make that decision out of, you know, merely having a good will, then by definition, because I've done it out of a good will, I've done it because it's what morality requires of me. So then you might ask, well, given that, how could it possibly turn out, and Kant thinks it can't, that in any situation we want to plug in for X, that my good will was on that particular occasion not good. So that can't happen. If we contrast that result with the case of intelligence, which is something that's also good, just not good without qualification, then there's going to be situations where we plug in some, you know, uh, some action for X, where in that particular situation my intelligence is not a good thing, and we just already saw an example of that. So that's why intelligence isn't good without qualification. But the same thing can't be said for a good will. So it's the only thing that's good without qualification. And here's maybe one way of illustrating this in case it's still unclear. So I'll go back to children drowning, right? So suppose I see a child drowning, and I realize that because there are sharks in the water, there's a good chance that I'll die, okay? <clears throat> if um, if I jump in to if I jump in to save the child, but I want to do the morally right thing, and for that reason, I jump in to save him. Now, suppose that goes horribly wrong. Suppose that, as a result, the child dies and would have otherwise survived, or, you know, make it even worse. Suppose that we both die, um, and that, you know, some additional horrible things happen, you know, happen as a result. So make this as awful as you want in terms of the consequences. But if my rationale is that I just wanted to do the morally right thing. I recognized that it was my duty to jump in and save the child, and um, that was my reason for jumping in. Then according to Kant, even though my actions brought about bad consequences, it's still going to be the case that my will was good. So we can come up with the craziest situation we want of me trying to do the right thing and horrible stuff happening as a result or whatever, but if I've got a good will, the, the overall assessment of the moral value of my actions is always going to be positive. Whereas we take things that are good only in a limited way, like intelligence, well, it depends on what I do with that intelligence. Do I use it to uh, you know, create a nuclear bomb to kill millions of people, or do I use it to create a vaccine to save millions of people? So. The upshot here is that it seems like doing the right thing for the right reason, and that's what it means to have a good will, is the only thing that's good unconditionally or without qualification. Now, you should be able to see that already, just from the way I've been speaking about this, that motives, according to Kant, are really quite important. Motives are what matter, consequences aren't. The motives for my action are what's morally relevant in assessing uh, the worth of my action for praise or blame, not the consequences of the action, what ends up happening as, 
as a result of the action that I performed. Um, so, you know, as I have in this bullet, when, we're, uh, when we are able to assign unconditional value to an action, that's because the motives from which the person acted are right, not consequences. So, you know, you can suppose that my motives in the drowning child case were different. Say, I only save the drowning child because I want a reward. And it seems like then our evaluation of the moral worth of the action, saving the drowning child, changes. So motives are what matters, um, not the consequences. So what gives a morally good action special value is the motivation behind it, uh, behind it. Or equivalently, as I say here, the principle on the basis of which the action was chosen, chosen um, or to use Kant's terminology, uh, willed, if you want to use that term instead of chosen. So, if that's right, okay, then if we could just figure out what principle the person of goodwill acts on, okay, a person who does have goodwill, what is the principle that they act on? If we could figure that out, that is to say if we could figure out what their motives are, then since, that was since that's what makes all the difference to whether an action has unconditional value, we will have figured out what it is that makes morally good actions good. And once we've, able, you know, once we've been able to do that, we're going to be able to figure out which particular actions or what kinds of actions are morally good. So this is the way that this is supposed to work, right? We're going to culminate in um, an understanding of what the moral law tells us to do. The way we're going to do that is to uh, figure out which particular actions are morally good. And the way we're going to do that is to look at the person who has goodwill and to figure out what principles they act on. Okay. And that's going to tell us what makes morally good actions good. So there's a lot going on there, but this is the way Kant is. Just in like one paragraph, you've got like a ton of information, and there aren't many philosophers like him. And so um, I, I think the experience of reading this and trying to like unpack just one single paragraph of the, of the text is going to prove to be much more challenging, but also potentially rewarding than any of the other reading we're going to do in this class. Okay, so how is it that we're going to accomplish this task? That is to say, figure out what the moral law tells us to do, which in turn we're going to do by doing this, which we're going to in turn do by doing this. How are we going to do that? Well, Kant thinks that the very first step should be to focus on the concept of duty. So. Here's an example. Suppose that for some reason my brother needs 50 bucks in order to survive. Kind of weird stipulation, but suppose that's true. Now, suppose also that he and I have recently undertaken a business venture, so we've you know started some business or something. And if that goes through, it's going to net me thousands, or even suppose hundreds of thousands of dollars. So th these two things are you know deliberately disconnected, right? So he needs 50 bucks in order to survive, and it's just an additional piece of information that we've got this business arrangement, and if it goes through, you know, months from now or whatever, um, we'll each inherit, you know, or we'll each make hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, I could, given that he needs his 50 bucks in order to survive, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know what he's gotten himself into, but I could have any of these or all of the following reasons for wanting to give him the $50. One is that he's in need and the morally right thing to do is to help him. Second is that I'm greedy and I realize that if I don't give him 50 bucks and he dies, then our business plan will fall through and I'll lose out on the thousands of dollars. That could be one motivation I might have for giving him the 50 bucks he needs in order to survive. Another might be that he's my brother and I love him so I want to help save him. <clears throat> and then finally I might think well, you know, I, I just take pleasure in helping people. I feel, feel good about it when I do it, and so that's why I'm going to give them 50 bucks. So these are four different distinct kinds of motivations or reasons I might have for giving him the 50 bucks he needs in order to live. Now, <clears throat> I could have just one of those reasons as the reason why I decide to help him. I could have, you know, two of them. I could even have all four of these. These could all four be reasons if you were to ask me, is this a reason why you want to help him? I could say yes, this, yes, this, yes, this, yes, right? I could have all four of those reasons simultaneously as reasons for me deciding to help him. But what Kant wants to show, and I think this is really fascinating, is that if the actual reason I end up helping him is two, which on the previous slide was that I'm greedy, basically, and I haven't done something morally good, even though we, there's been a good consequence that he's been saved. 
similarly, if the actual reason I end up helping him is three, which was basically just that he's my brother, so I care about him, if that's my reason for wanting to help him, then I still haven't done something morally good, even though he's been saved and I did it out of love. So this is where it starts to seem weird, right? What do you mean I haven't done something morally good if my motivation was that he's my brother and I want to save him? Right, but that's what Kant contends, okay? And then uh, finally, if the reason I end up helping him is four, which was that I, derive, I just like helping people, then according to Kant, I still haven't done something morally good. <clears throat> Even though my action has had the good consequence that he's been saved. And even though I have this character trait, which seems to be commendable, namely that I like helping people. <clears throat> so according to Kant, the only case in which my action was morally good, or equivalently praiseworthy, is the case in which I help him for the reason one, which was that it's my duty. Okay, so this I think at first blush just seems insane, right? We, we looked at these four different motives I could have for helping my brother, giving him the 50 bucks he needs in order to live, right? And two is the only one that seems clearly to be, a, you know, a not morally praiseworthy reason for wanting to help him. If I'm greedy, you could make the case that I haven't done something morally right uh, by giving him the 50 bucks, even though it did save him. Uh, that's a, a lousy reason for deciding to help him. But one, three, and four all look like reasons I could have for helping my brother, which would be morally commendable. But according to Kant, no, 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 no. This, if this is my reason for saving him, I haven't done something morally good. If this is my reason for saving him, I haven't done something morally good either. And obviously, if this is, I haven't. But only in this situation, where I save him just because it's the morally right thing to do, only in that situation have I done something morally good. So I think at least, I remember, you know, as an undergrad, when I was reading this stuff, that when I encountered that, I just thought that was insane. But what we're going to do is look at his reasons for thinking this. Okay, so one thing that's really fascinating about all of this is that it leads Kant to the highly counterintuitive view that uh, ideally what we want is for... Um, an individual to not take any pleasure in doing the morally right thing. We want them to do the morally right thing, but to not take any pleasure in doing so. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why he would hold such a strange view. So if we uh, consider this brother case we were just discussing, suppose that I had two motives simultaneously for helping him and giving him the 50 bucks he needs. Suppose those were, one, that it's my duty, and that's what Kant uh, thinks is the only basis for saying that my action was morally praiseworthy. But I also have this other motive, um, just that he's my brother and so I care about him. Okay, well, if I have those two motives, then we're not necessarily going to know whether it was um, acting out of duty that ultimately motivated me, or whether it was the fact that he was my brother um, that ultimately motivated me. So, um, the problem is that if it was uh, concern for my duty that moved me to act, then my action would be considered morally good, he thinks. But if it was the other motivation, just that he's my brother, and so I have a special concern for him that I wouldn't for others, then my action, he claims, wouldn't be morally um, praiseworthy. But that's problematic, because then we don't know how to judge whether an action is, uh, you know, uh, praiseworthy or blameworthy or neither. So we sort of eliminate all of this if my only do if my only motive for acting the way that I did was just that um, it was the morally right thing to do. And so if I don't take any pleasure in doing what happens to be morally right, then th there's not this sort of indeterminacy about. Uh, the moral status of some action or other of mine. And what I think is really interesting about this is it stands in direct opposition to Aristotle, who we haven't read for this class, but a, a big part of his moral theory is the idea that a virtuous person actually takes pleasure in doing what's right or virtuous. And I think that, you know, to the extent that we've really thought about this at all in our, you know, everyday lives, it's probably that Aristotelian view that lines up better with our intuitions about such things. I think very few of us are naturally inclined to think that um, 
ideally what we want in moral agents is individuals who um, don't take pleasure in doing the right thing, they just do it because it's their duty. But the reason why Kant thinks that that's what's ideal is that we, is that we then know that their actions were motivated only out of um, concern for the moral law um, rather than being based on see, sort of squishy things like human emotions and stuff. So what's so bad about that anyway? Well, um, we're going to get to that uh, presently. So, I mean, you, you might be saying, like, look, you know, this is just ridiculous. Um, and I've kind of already insinuated that I think that's the natural view to take. It's certainly the view I took when I first encountered all of this as a student. You might say, like, look, you know, I saved my brother, and I did it because I cared about him. Um, so why shouldn't that um, be enough to qualify my actions as morally praiseworthy? And Kant's view is just this, okay? Those, those kinds of motivations... Um, special relationships between me and family members or loved ones or friends or um, being constituted in such a way that I just happen to take pleasure in helping other people. Those sorts of things are just totally contingent. Those could be otherwise. Um, you know, maybe instead of it be my brother, it's uh, somebody else who equally needs my help um, and is equally deserving of, uh, of this act, but whom I don't have any special tie to. And so... Um, what happens then if my motivation was just that you know, I cared about this person? So those kinds of motivations are contingent is the idea. So, you know, it just so happens that you love this person or that person, um, or it just so happens that you're built in such a way that you enjoy helping others. But if those kinds of motivations, if those kinds of facts about you or facts about the relationship between you and others were different, you wouldn't have the motivation for doing what's morally required of you, but it would still be morally required of you so it can't be correct to say that you're doing something morally right when you act for those kinds of reasons. The only circumstance, in other words, in which you're doing something morally praiseworthy is when you act simply out of regard for the moral law, simply out of uh, concern for what morality requires of you. So um, you might also say, like, look, the fact that um, saving him is the morally right thing to do isn't my reason for saving him if... I'm saving him just because he's my brother, or saving him because I enjoy helping people who are in need. Clearly, my reason in those situations is just that, you know, I love him or I feel good about doing such things. And so if that's not my reason, and this is sort of just the most basic way of putting it, um, Kant's going to say, like, if your reason isn't that it's a morally right thing to do, then how could it be that uh, what you did was morally praiseworthy? Okay, so... The upshot here seems to be that you've only performed a morally right action when your reason for performing it was that it was your moral duty to do so. And so that explains uh, why Kant takes this bizarre view that um, ideally we won't take pleasure in doing our duty, we'll just do it. And you might even take this a step further and say, um, well, what would really be ideal would be if you don't want to do your duty, right? If you don't have any inclination or desire to do what's morally required of you, but you do it anyway, because at least in that case, we'll know for certain that the uh, thought of duty alone was sufficient to produce the action, um, and that the action, therefore, was done out of moral, uh, was done out of respect for the moral law, and thus that it's uh, morally good. Okay, so just in closing for today, I want to talk just a little bit about these different kinds of motivation, and these are going to map pretty neatly onto the way that I've set it up so far, but I'm going to use his jargon now so that when you're reading the text, you sort of spot um, the locations where what we've been talking about recently um, in this lecture map on to um, his language and the way that he presents it. So in his terminology, there's three different kinds of motivation, basically. You might perform an action from duty or out of respect for your duty, and in that case, your motivation for performing the action is simply that you think it's the right thing to do, and we've seen that that is the only motivation that Kant thinks is um, going to be relevant uh, to ethics. And second, you might perform an action out of what he calls immediate inclination, and I believe that's the terminology that he uses. There's a little bit of a difficulty here, and that's that um, different translations of Kant um, translate some key phrases differently, but I believe this is the way that it's phrased in the particular translation from German that you're reading for this class. So immediate inclination, well what does that mean? That would just mean 
performing an action for the reason that you enjoy performing actions of that kind, inclination, right? So that, um, what, what I have labeled two here, is meant to capture <clears throat> things like familial relations, special relations, where there's some kind of uh, love or care involved and that that would be the motivation for um, behaving morally, as well as um, constitutive facts about your psychology, like just enjoying helping others. And then, finally, um, you could be perform you could be motivated to perform an action because you're impelled to do so through another inclination, is the terminology he uses. And um, in the brother case, this would be the scenario where um, my motivation for giving him the 50 bucks is just that there's really something else I want, and it's the greedy thing that <clears throat> I want him to live so that we can execute this business venture and I can make the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are coming my way. So in cases of, of this third kind, your motivation for, for performing the action it's just that doing so is a means to some other end. Um, so you can achieve some other goal by performing the action, and it's really that other thing um, that you care about and that you're concerned to bring about. Um, but performing the action that we're evaluating uh, for moral praiseworthiness or blameworthiness is just a means to that end. And so I think pretty clearly in that kind of situation, uh, you're not morally praiseworthy. Uh, for the action, whether you agree with the other controversial stuff that Kant has, um, that we've been talking about, certainly this kind of case, um, like the greed scenario and the brother case, that's going to very clearly not be a morally praiseworthy action because I didn't even really care about that action itself. I only cared about it to the extent that it allowed me to get something else. And what Kant does in the excerpt that you're reading, there's a section where he talks about some different cases, and I think there is. Um, maybe four, but he provides, as I say on this bullet, some interesting cases that are supposed to illuminate those three different kinds of motivation, and he's going to try in that passage to make clear why um, acting out of respect for one's duty is um, the only kind of motivation that uh, is morally correct. So this material, as I've said, multiple times now. This reading is really going to be quite difficult. Um, it's going to be important that you just sort of you know, soldier through it, um, but I wish you luck in um, working through what is truly a difficult text, um, and I'll be picking up on Thursday with further analysis of the text um, so that, you know, you're going to have as good a chance as possible of understanding what he's uh, writing. All right, see you guys later.